talk about is really about what you're going to see when you take the tour of this facility is obviously the change in what's going on around outsourcing. Printing today, as I think many of you know, has changed more in the last 10 years than it's changed in 100. Uh, when we started the discussion, I think I had asked Skip and uh, I think one of the ladies here, there you are, spoke about what was Explore. Um, as I think Warren mentioned, you know, some of his background back, you know, was, which was Vescom, which was really the originator of Convestrix. And there were really maybe two or three service bureaus at the time in the late 70s. And, you know, the 9700 was really the first page printer, actually it was Xerox 1200 for some of us who were really been around, that were in the industry and you usually went out to solicit business taking green fan fold paper that was taken to a duplicator and to make it easy to touch, easy to, to work with. And just think about where this industry has come. I was talking to one of my uh, old microfiche programmers this past week <laughs> and you know, he was just commenting a little bit about, uh, wow, you know, the whole Broadridge DST acquisition, which I'll talk about in a moment. And, you know, he was talking about, you know, some of the service bureaus that we had when we first started doing a lot of the stuff in New York where, you know, it was one story that uh, ADP at the time was, had sold a group of data copy, for some of you may know the name of uh, that entity who I had started their operation in New York. And, you know, one day we came in and we had no place to print. I was printing work from the New York Stock Exchange at the time. So we had 19700 was put into some uh, building that you wouldn't even want to walk around in. And it's the middle of the summer. We need to deliver this work to the stock exchange tomorrow. There's no air conditioning. It's, you know, 98 degrees. And we literally took dry ice and a fan to make the 9700 work. So, you know, you talk about how the, how the industry has changed, and you'll see that in a moment. And uh, I'm sure, like many of you, we all have a lot of war stories. <clears throat> but in the service bureau area, it's really about delivering on behalf of your customers. So what we thought we'd talk about today is really give you a little bit of background of Broadridge. You're going to be out on the floor and see some things, and Cameron, who runs this facility, will speak to you about you know, some of his war stories as well. Uh, we're going to talk about why people are outsourcing today. Why is that important today more so than it ever was in the past? Give you a little bit of look of uh, the future of print. Uh, I know there's uh, some folks here from Pitney Bowes and Rico and, and what's going on, and you're going to see some of the latest technology here. We have some other facilities around the country that we really pride ourselves, as many of you who may also be in this business, pride on yourselves on the equipment and what you run and how this business has changed. Um, talk a little bit about the roadmap to alternate channels. You know, everyone's got a buzzword for, you know, multi channel, omni channel, every which way of channels. At the end of the day, let's talk about how the customer is embraced and what his demands are going to be and how you as companies or we as service providers need to be able to deliver upon that. Okay, <clears throat> so we talk about Broadridge Customer Communications and DST. For most of you that are here probably know that we acquired the communications business of DST. So that includes all the verticals that they served and touched as far as uh, the areas of their customer communications business. So we're now really known as BRCC, Broadridge Customer Communication. So that's really the new combined entity of all of those production facilities. And yes, I don't mind you taking a picture. This is all public information. We're a public company. So, uh, you know, we were spun off from ADP, as others may or may not know, some nine years ago. Uh, so, you know, it gives you. <laughs> so, Exactly. So uh, we as Broadridge are a $4 billion company. To give you some perspective of what we do in the way of communications, uh, we delivered over 4 billion communications this past year as the combined entity. We're touching 75% of every household in North America in either a regulatory document, a billing document, or a brokerage statement. The old Broadridge, as some of you may know us, we're really focused on one single channel that being the financial services sector. So now as we've expanded to the combined entity, we now touch all the different verticals in the business, whether it be financial organizations, billing entities, healthcare entities, and 
anyone who's sending out any type of document, document in any type of format, whether that be printed, electronic, or the new alternate channels. So that gives you a little bit of uh, the who we are. And it really comes down to that, you know, when you think about it, as many of us thought about print and mail, we're really a technology company that just happens to use print and mail as one of those delivery mechanisms. Whoops. Okay, give you a little bit of a road map, you know, up until the acquisition. We used to keep this picture out here because, you know, we know the big one was coming and the facilities, you know, that we couldn't touch on the west coast um, were not there. Now with the acquisition, we have five primary print mail production facilities as well as some data centers. So uh, the facilities span from east coast to west coast. That include in Long Island, we have two facilities there. Uh, totaling about 750,000 square feet. They're around the corner from each other and that they wouldn't allow us to keep building the extensions. We have a facility, as I refer to, in uh, Metro New York City, which is actually right around the corner from Giant Stadium or Secaucus, New Jersey, Kansas City, El Dorado Hills, California, and West Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, all the facilities are all certified with just about every and any kind of certification you have, whether that be HIPAA, um, we have all the SSAE-16s, PCI compliance, ISO 27001. And once again, as we talk about those volumes, big is not always better. However, we pride ourselves, as large as we are, as being able to service our customers in the way in which they need to be serviced. Um, you know, our recurring revenue model is extremely important. Um, you know, we really pride ourselves on our customer retention. And those days come back from the ADP model or ADP payroll when we were also acquired by them a number of different companies ago. Uh, so it's really about all about customer retention and making sure that you're servicing both today and tomorrow because yesterday's old news, particularly when you're doing the work that many of us do here where everything is going out every day, every week, every month. You know, there's not many people that I know of that pick up the phone and call their broker, their bank, whomever it may be, and say, by the way, I got my statement today. It looks great. The envelope was sealed, and thank you for delivering it. <laughs> okay? And inevitably, the only person who gets a mismatch statement, which it happens, you know, we talk about quality rates that are, go out six decimal points, the only time you ever get a mismatch statement is it's going to the CEO, CIO, or whomever senior level C-suite person. So, you know, it's really pretty interesting. But when we talk about outsourcing, what is extremely important is you need to have those building blocks of success. We talk about our own individual experiences and what we've been able to learn in the industry. Explore talks about when they put together the glossary of terms because the business is not a dying business, but it's hard to be able to talk about the things that are so relevant to us in this business. So we like to build upon that knowledge base, that intellectual capital, because that's really where we learn from. So why do people look to outsource? It's really around the centers of excellence. Most of the firms that are doing a lot of the work internally have done it in support of their customer business, in support of what they need to do to communicate but really, is that their core competency? Okay, if you're a financial institution, certainly printing and mailing statements is by no means your core competency. And those are the types of things that I think we all talk about as we look to look how we're going to potentially grow our business. So in outsourcing, you want to take advantage of the domain knowledge. You want to be able to look at market prof profiles. What are other companies within my industry doing? And we at Broadridge typically have a number of focus groups where we bring our customers in into this very room to interact with each other because we only get better by working with the customers and for them to understand what we're doing and how each one of those customers are doing it independent of each other and what could everybody gain in delivering better communications. And to give you a little bit about what we do when we talk about everything that we're doing on behalf of our customer base is you know, we look to really potentially reach in our pocket. So we guarantee performance. Okay, you know, years ago it was really pretty easy to guarantee performance. God forbid somebody went to you and said you had to reach in your pocket. You wouldn't know what to do just because the sheer cost of postage is a multiple of the service revenues. 
Okay, so you know it really changes a lot of these dynamics. Okay, why do they outsource? Similar to what we said, it's really about one single very, very important thing, improve that customer experience. Okay, the cost today of bringing on many of the pieces of the gear that are in your shops or you're gonna see out in the back, it was pretty simple. An inserter, you buy a smart feeder folder, you would buy either a Bell and Howells, um, I forget what it was, the workshop special, $35,000, smart feeder folder for about $20,000, you were doing intelligent inserting. Okay, and whether it's the Pitney's machine, the other guy's machine, or whomever's machine, inserter today is running close to a million dollars. As those firms start to gain more adoption, what happens in an internal shop? The variable costs all of a sudden continue to rise. Menu-driven, variable cost basis and coming to a third-party provider oftentimes is going to make a much more cost-effective model. Um, refreshing technology. Okay, if you look at a plant, you had two or three machines, inevitably you need to go and write a check for $5 million, $10 million. Okay, all of a sudden the cost of capital becomes very important because the cost of the printers, and I know we have some Rico people here, some Pitney Bowes people here, very similarly, we talked about the 9700. Gosh, that was, you know, that was a beast, that was a bear. It was maybe a $200,000 investment. Okay, today, Okay, you know, whether it be Rico's equipment or someone else's equipment, it's a seven-figure seven investment. So these plants that you're going to see, whether it's ours or anybody else's, it's true manufacturing. Okay, we measure throughput, we measure input. We need to keep these machines running just like any other manufacturing plant in order to bring a cost-effective solution on behalf of our customer base. What people don't realize is all the other costs that go into getting that piece of mail out, whether it be the development, whether it be your ability to deliver good customer service, being able to have people on the phone that can interact with you as the customers, that have experience and a knowledge base to be able to communicate properly. All those things add up as to why it's a wise choice to outsource. You know, I gotta take I gotta I gotta I gotta take up my forty five minutes, you know. Uh, but you know, you talked Jerry talked a minute ago about fit and focus and things like that in your industry, and, and then you talk about the technology refresh. We have found in, in many cases when you're talking about the larger firms, when that refresh happens is when the whole question of fit and focus comes about. Because suddenly now <coughs> the CFO of a company is trying to figure out why I'm spending twenty million dollars on print and mail equipment when that's not my core competence. So that, that, you know, no matter how good of a deal it is, that's when those questions start to come up. So then you start to look for economies of scale, you start to look for an outsourced provider. And then the, the second point uh, that I wanted to make that Jerry touched on that I think is terribly crucial for anyone who picks a provider, whether it's Broadridge or anyone, is that you need to look at the industry expertise that you're dealing with. Um, I cannot tell you the value that a lot of our financial services customers see in hey, this new regulation 15C3 just came out. How is Morgan Stanley dealing with that? How is Edward Jones dealing with that? How is this company dealing with that? And we're able to, with our partnerships, go grab that data and share it with our customers so that they can understand in your world, in your marketplace, this is how regulations are being interpreted. This is how you're dealing with it. One case that I always give an example of, a new regulation came out. One of our financial firms interpreted it as a 72-page insert that went into their mail. The other one interpreted it as a three-by-five buck slip that went into their mail. Com <laughs> same regulation, two different companies. So understanding how that can play to your favor uh, is very, very important. It's part of the value add you should be looking for. And by the way, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to, to stop us. But really, when it comes down to not only the customer experience, in today's world, you need to have peace of mind with whomever your vendor selection is, as well as your internal operation, um, because as we look around the room, you know, everyone needs to have some job security. So making the right decision with the right partner becomes critical, and certainly trying to be able to determine things that are gonna bring cost savings. Because uh, at the end of the day, no one's looking to increase costs, and 
you know, really when we look to examine, and we'll talk a little bit about the alternate channels in a minute, you know, it's pretty easy to say what one is going to do and how we're going to potentially, you know, save some money and who's going to be on that bleeding edge with the new technology. Um, you know, if I ask the room and you say, you know, everyone, you know, now does online banking and we'll talk about some of those delivery mechanisms. I guess for those of us in the Northeast, does uh, anyone remember the name Chemical Bank? Okay, you know, Chemical actually in a joint partnership was the first bank that to ever do online billing and it was called Pronto. And by the way, those statements were produced by Convestrix and Pronto went out of business. Okay, because the consumers weren't willing to adopt that. Okay, and it was too early. Same thing if you take a look and think about the closed systems that were out for ATM networks. They were all closed. Today, you know, who would ever think of going out with just a credit card or, you know, their ATM card and not drive with cash? For some of us road warriors years and years ago, if you didn't drive with a couple hundred dollars in cash, if you were on the road, you couldn't go out because you never knew where you were going to be or where you needed to sleep and they weren't going to take credit cards for some of us real dinosaurs. <laughs> okay. When we look at what the outsourcing, the providing value and experience, that's really what we pride ourselves on. Um, as well as firms internally pride themselves on their core competencies, we really look at the overall experience. Um, and is it the right business model? Oftentimes there's hybrid approaches where you need to have an on-campus solution and an off-campus solution. I know Andrea is here from, from Systems Where we happen to you know, be one of our business partners. And you know, how many of the firms, there was a period of time not that long ago where we at Broadridge were printing green bar fanfold type paper, okay, at the tune of close to three million images a night. Data would come in at 2 a.m. in the morning, had to be out the door by 6 a.m. in the pigeonholes. We were located right around the corner from the stock exchange before 9-11. We were, had all the printers that you'll see here spread over four different floors, 17 different roll systems. It was an engineering nightmare. You know, you used to have some of the uh, rolling, uh, what do you call them? The, uh, you know, things like the supermarket, literally going through the men's and ladies' room as it went through different floors. Okay, you know, at the end of the day, that was what the customers needed. That's what the financial firms depended upon. And they worked with all of those reports, physical reports, as compared to having alternate archival solutions. And we used to really refer to that as, you know, when you want the answer, not the report. And that went from microfiche to alternate deliveries to CDs, um, you know, as to now having archival systems to be able to really interrogate data and provide better solutions than print and mail for report architectures. Okay, so, uh, you know, we have, as I started to say, integrated solutions. Um, you know, predominantly my favorite colors truly were black and white, despite the fact that we were here really on the bleeding edge with a lot of the color technology. Uh, we started in the color business, I'm going to say somewhere around 14 years ago with the Accent Sciences color boxes, which were really nothing more than fancy crayons. When you're out on the floor, you're going to see some, you know, pretty interesting technology. Um, and if, uh, you know, we were to take you to our newest facilities by way of the acquisition, uh, you see a whole different array of inkjet technology. Dry toner based solutions are pretty much passe. I don't believe anybody else is even selling them other than small devices. Uh, everything is now moved to inkjet technology. So we look for what the right application is to be able to bring the right decisions to be able to conform with whether it be compliancy, regulatory information. And for those of you who may not know some of the core pieces of the business when we were at Broadridge, uh, we deliver every one of those proxy envelopes that you may or may not get in those green wrap uh, envelopes. Okay, we have that small little market share we like to pride ourselves on, on about 99.9% .9 of that market. There are one or two outliers out there, and uh, our CEO, Rich Daly, really prides himself as there's nothing as far as market capability until you have 100% uh, saturation. So, uh, you know, in the print mail space, despite we have competition, we have a long way to go to get to that 100% benchmark. As I said earlier is, you know, the service bureau, and we like to believe it's Broadridge, um, is really all about 
customer communications and enhancing that customer experience. Whether it's in transactional documents, marketing and fulfillment kits, so we'll combine all the various POD you know, applications that go on. Uh, this facility doesn't have any of uh, your more traditional cut sheet applications. In our New York operation, we're providing all the enrollment kits for seven of the top nine retirement entities. So if you have an advisor and he's, produced, he's got a seminar at the Marriott, we oftentimes are doing all of those retirement kits for bulk distribution as well as individual distribution to the individual customer. On the regulatory work, for any of you who are aware of what's changing in the financial sector, we're really directly involved with all the Department of Labor DOL regulations and distribution of all of that information, really, which is all the full disclosure that your advisor has to give to you about all the fees. So there's a myriad of different things in the industry going on. And you know, because we're so directly involved in that retirement services space, as we look at all the different things that we at Broadridge do, which also include that about 33% of every trade on Wall Street is processed off of the Broadridge back office systems. Um, we clear somewhere in the range of, I think last count, about $5 trillion a day off of our clearing and swift operations of moving of monies. Uh, so, you know, we're far beyond just print and mail, and that's really what we're all about as a technology-driven company. Fact or fiction? And I tried to consolidate some of these slides. We have a couple of good points that are here, and some of our information does come from InfoTrends, as well as Kemmel and Madison and a number of different things. But it really comes down to that 75% of the bills and statements are traditionally printed. And you know, if you talk to your friends, neighbors, or even internally here, except for some of us of certain age and that we love to get paper, um, paper's still the end thing. Okay. And, you know, regardless of whatever the industry, and I know there's a number of folks here from Blue Cross, and, you know, when we talk about EOBs and your challenges of reduction of cost, um, you know, aside from the fact that even healthcare has almost become more stringent than the financial services sector as far as making sure that, you know, confidentiality of data is so critical. Uh, but we know that that's going to change. You know, what we like to say is, you know, regardless of what direction you're going with your strategies towards electronic or alternate deliveries, it's better to have a strategy than no strategy because you can never catch up. The real challenge around that is the expense that it takes to build that strategy early. What we do know that 
printing is going to change. Those dynamics are going to change. The ability to make documents different than they are as static documents are going to change. And certainly, what's the timeline? We believe it's in the next three to five years. Nobody wants to be the last man standing in a bricks and mortar business, no different than what's happening in the retail community. However, you need to have the blend of both. Print is not going to die. It's just going to change. Okay, what's the next level of digital inkjet? Um, and I think you know, you'll know you see on the floor here um, just about all Ricoh equipment. So you know, we'll, someone over in, on the right side of the floor is going to say thank you. Um, however, you know, as we look to do things a little bit differently, um, our facilities in El Dorado Hills, Kansas City, and uh, outside, of, outside of Hartford and West Hartford have different technology. Uh, and really, when you look at those applications, they, the facilities that we happen to have purchased were built around billing applications. So, you know, we can go as compared to running too wide on whether it's uh, the Canon equipment or the Ricoh equipment, I can go four wide on some of the new technology that we basically have built and re-engineered. Um, we can combine as compared to householding of statements in line with data, we can take if you get three statements coming to a household, we can rewrap that document, put those three individual envelope packages into one single statement pack maximizing postal discounts because postage is the single biggest expense that every one of you have to deal with as a multiple of what the service fees are going to be. So we really... You already do household expenses. Let me be clear, that's not what we're talking about here. So what, what, you know, we talked about this earlier where there's, within a company there's five different silos. I've got this division and this division and this division. And within the divisions, they're really good at householding. But what's not always prevalent is the fact that across the divisions, they don't think about householding on the same day. So, the, so to use a financial service as an example, my house tomorrow may get a check, they may get a, a 401k statement, and we may get a know your customer mail. Those are three completely different divisions in my provider. All three of those are gonna come to my house from the same mailing company, I guarantee you, but they're gonna be three separate envelopes. Our t what we're talking about is statement packs where yes, they're created as three separate envelopes, we're going to take those three separate envelopes, put them in a single envelope, and save three times the postage to one. Yes, there's a little bit of degradation because the weight is higher, but the overall, overall there is savings there. Plus a customer experience, again, you're going back to, I've opened a single envelope instead of multiple. So, 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 that, so that weight restriction is going away in January. That's correct. That's exactly right. right. Yeah. Everything's coming in our favor in that regard. I agree. Yeah, the, you know, when you mentioned the statement, the check, and the marketing, are you getting people to buy in on putting a check in with? Yeah, so, so there, now, there's adoption. That's one of our big things that we're seeing. There's a lot of reluctance on, in our company to include a check in a mailing that isn't related to that check. It, it, it is a paradigm shift, there's no doubt. I can tell you uh, I can tell you about this now because their name has changed and everything else. We used to do the, the, the statements for uh, A.G. Edwards long ago, okay? And let me give you an example of where that didn't play out very well. We would put the, the monthly dividend check in with their statement. Sounds like a great idea. You save two things into one. And the way that their statement was done at the time, it was half folded. So they also put in all their marketing inserts. And so what customers unfortunately did was they got their statement, they opened it up, over the trash can, there it goes, and I keep my statement. They were throwing away their check. And so we had to re-engineer that for them. We did what they wanted. We put it in there, but we had to re-engineer it so that the check was on the top. So that the customer would see it. So yeah, there's some there's some adoption concerns, and we do have to work with our customers to figure out what that looks like. Um, but you know, where where we've seen a lot of adoption of this, quite frankly, is in the utility business, where you've got uh, a, a phone company who is sending out three different types of letters to the same household the same day, but again, it's three different divisions. They don't know what they're doing uh, it cross functionally. So they say, yeah, absolutely, save us some money and put them together. So there's application, but this is we're right on the cusp of. of this being fairly new, we're still developing it for our company. Uh, and, and it really comes down to not just risk and reward. However, you know, where does it, you know, do you need a pea shooter or, uh, you know, a machine gun to be able to get you to that point? Okay, and, you know, oftentimes, whomever it is, you know, many of us have, you know, clients or applications, you know, there might be, you know, 250 pieces, you know, 
what's it got to cost me in development to get to where we want? So for time and money, you can accomplish anything you want. Okay, but what's the best practice and the most practical approach? Um, you know, we have a number of clients that we deal with that, you know, why people aren't taking the checks ACH, we've yet to figure out. And, you know, we have other clients that are trust statement clients and large dollar balances. And if they want it printed sideways, any which way a Sunday they want it, they'll take the statement that we may have produced or someone produced and bring it to a copier, enlarge it. You know, um, aside from any of the disability acts that are going on and what you need to do to accommodate those firms or those customers. Um, so, you know, for time and money, you can accomplish whatever you want and which is the best and most practical approach to enhance that client experience. So this just gives you a little bit of a, picture, uh, a snapshot of some of the different technologies we, we may deploy across our uh, enterprise. Um, we're really, really big on postage savings, as everyone is. It's not just really solely around pre-sort. We do commingle in the new facilities that we <clears throat> just purchased. A different philosophy of how we process. Traditionally, we used to go to third-party pre-sort houses, as many of you do. Our preference is to manifest in line, get the maximum postal discounts, particularly for regionalized mailings. Um, postage is an art. Okay, postage savings is an art. It's, you know, not the way it was once upon a time where you sit at the back of the machine, put the rubber bands around the three digit, the five digit. And, uh, you know, it was funny. Actually, I had my kids in one of the shops, goes back about 30 years ago. Uh, and, you know, for a summer job, I had them at the back of the machine, you know, taking rubber bands and doing pre-sort. That lasted about a day. <laughs> and they quickly said, we're never doing this again. You know, and uh, I'm sure everyone has, uh, you know, a couple of those, uh, you know, stories. But you'll see in the factory what we do, how we do it. It's the end of the day. It's the middle of the month. So we're actually pretty quiet right about now, I think. Okay. So uh, I never know on any given day, but it gives you a little bit of perspective. So you're full manifest now? Uh, we're not full. We do everything. You're you still have a vendor? Yeah. It's, it's really, what, it's a function of the customer request. Okay. To be quite frank. You know, it's density. Uh, you know, utility bills are pretty much 100% manifested. Uh, national. You're talking about shifting the manifest, and I was like, you know, you're not leveraging the low volume pieces out of the Yeah. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a combination, okay? Um, and it's really just getting an understanding and working. And the best way to describe it is, you know, you become really a consultative sale. When we get the opportunity to avoid, that's a whole different subject, RFPs. Okay, which is certainly uh, for those who may have attended some of the uh, other sessions I may have done, which was the, uh, the good, the bad, the ugly around an RFP. And, uh, you know, I guess it was Elizabeth Gooding. Let's see if I get the, 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 her comment right. You know, there were two things that you didn't want to buy uh, on price. It was sushi and, uh, I'm trying, <laughs> and I'm trying to remember. I think it was print and mail, but, you know, she had a really tagline that was just wonderful. And it really just said it all. Um, yes, RFPs, RFIs are probably more of a necessary evil. You know, this business has gotten to a point where everybody knows the price of what an image is, what the price is to insert a piece, almost. You can do the arithmetic yourself. What they don't take into account are all the other variables. And where's the road going? Okay, it's a completely different paradigm, and this shift is going to change faster than any of us know, at least as best we can figure it out, and no one has that crystal ball. But I think, you know, really what we're really talking about is time to reimagine mail. Um, and we're quite proud of what we've done, what we've invested in. And here's a pretty typical person, typical household, as Cameron said, of what he just received. So the Franklins on any given day, really on a month, bills, statements, checks, they're getting it all. Okay, you know, some people want to react, some people want to text. I think earlier, as many of you do, and I'm glad to see I'm at least maybe keeping some people excited. They're not really on their phones the whole time. So, you know, I remember going to sessions where you went in and did a presentation and, uh, you know, you would block out people to be on their Blackberries because no one was paying attention, okay? But how they're going to get their information are extremely important. And you need to be able to make it available. This actually, I think, one came from, uh, you know, Info trends, if I'm not mistaken, and, you know, everybody's digital in some way, shape, or form. Everybody's got a different view to digital. 
Um, there's, you know, over three, building, three billion global users are online. 95% of the households are online in some way, shape, or fashion. Okay, look at the sm sm global smartphone users. I mean, these numbers are staggering. Uh, you know, I'm glad to say that, uh, you know, for most of us in the room, we didn't have to deal with uh, anyone have Samsung phones and how to replace them. <laughs> you know, I'm glad they're not in this room because I don't think we have the fire packs. <laughs> okay, but it's reality, you know. People really, and once you get adjust, uh, accustomed to your one device, you're not changing. You know, the biggest transition, I think, for all of us was BlackBerry to a smartphone. And if we still had the keyboard from the BlackBerry, I think many of us would be a whole lot happier and we wouldn't be sending some bad messages. Okay, uh, consumers are pretty slow to adopt, as Cameron just mentioned, and what we see. You know, 23% of the population still want to see paper, and this was info, info trend statistics. 50% um, want both. Okay, so how do you as the vendor be able to pretend, potentially send something and look to reduce my costs? You know, we went from black and white to color, even though color pricing has come down significantly almost to the cost of black and white. As a percentage, it's still a pretty significant increase that you have to go upstream to management to say, hey, I'm going to produce a better document, I'm going to get a better response rate, but oh, by the way, I'm increasing my overall cost between 15 to 30 percent, depending upon volume. It may not be 15. And now look at the dynamics. Look what it costs for me to support all of this. Okay, now we know that that's going to change. How it's going to go change is really going to be driven by the consumer. Okay, you know, the world talks about multi-channel, omni-channel. I've yet to figure out why they call it omni as compared to multi because it's multiple channels and how you want to reference it. I don't even know what the new one is other than, you know, really, we really are talking about cloud services and how we're going to deliver those documents to any type of device, whether it be tablet, phone. Oh, yeah. So I think that's a, it's an important distinction. If you have the skills to be omni, you're better than multi. So. And that's actually, it's, it's, I'm glad that you said that because I think we all just learned something. <laughs> okay, because I would have never known it to be exactly that. However, the ability in that omni channel delivery is to be able to be better because that document can now be interactive. Whether it's interactive on your phone, Although, you know, and I continually have this discussion with a number of people, particularly in the financial services sector, as most people, unless you're a pretty heavy-duty trader, you're really with an advisor, and it's all fee-based. Am I really going to get my confirmation on my phone? Who cares? Okay. However, you know, if I'm looking that I need to pay my mortgage statement and it's late or my utility bill because I, need to, I don't want to have it shut off, I want to be able to make that single click view and pay and do that and have it archived any which way a Sunday. Um, but really it's about optimizing that statement presentation. Um, being able to provide robust campaigns and client portal information. Okay, so you know what we're doing and many of you may have heard of our uh, joint venture with Pitney, Do Pitney Bowes referred to as Inlet. All that plumbing and the ability to deliver in multiple different channels has really been built by Broadridge and Pitney. So we've gone from Volley to Inlet to, you know, a, a number of different things. But really, you know, when you think about it, and, you know, we do the same things, Frank. You know, we as the vendor and who you talk to in the organization, you know, back to my comment, better to have a strategy than no strategy, and it's all about timing. However, because of what we've been able to fund into this project, we're still waiting for those returns. We're now finally starting to see that wave of what the mailers want and what the companies want, but yet the consumer has yet to sign up, has yet to say, I want to get that one single electronic mailbox. We know that wave is coming by virtue of what was just done for those who may or may not have attended Money 2020. And we can talk about all those channels independently, but you know, once again, as much as you're here in Broadridge, it's not a commercial. 
We welcome the opportunity to tell you more at any point in time, whether it be Cameron or myself. Skip has our contact information. We can, you know, inform you of what we seem to see. Back to what Cameron started to talk about is the client preferences are certainly differentiated by market segment. You know, once again, you know, this was really, you know, we don't make these numbers up. All that we're doing is really taking these and being able to share as to what is going on in the marketplace. And for those who've attended, uh, whether it's Explore conferences or others, um, you know, the, the InfoTrends presentations are probably as good as it gets uh, on where markets and market segments are going. Uh, well, you, I, I couldn't hear that one. Yours are equally as good, Campbell. Okay, so on, uh, you know, the ability to drive digital solutions, and you know, I'm going to go through some of this stuff pretty quick, seeing hard to believe I've used up my time, uh, so I'm sensitive to that, Skip. Uh, I don't want to, you know, throw your agenda off, seeing you know you've allowed me to step in. Um, however, you're going to deliver those documents, and the hard part is on the development side. Is the development has to be set up in such a way that you can deliver it in any format to any device. Uh, and, you know, that's whether it's us or any of the other folks here, you know, we have literally, you know, 50 to 300 different developers working on this stuff solely in the composition area, uh, depending upon the device and depending upon what the document is going to look like. What's the network effect? And this is really all about the inlet discussion that we started to have. So there are alternate channels that are out there that people are being able to deliver with one single channel. What we've developed is the ability to deliver to approximately 10 different channels. So what's really transpired in Europe, we believe will take hold here in the United States. It's just a matter of when, not necessarily if. And we can support, whether it be Amazon, Dropbox, Evernote, all the different channels that we've developed with Inlet. And we'd be happy to share that information with you because I think it is the future, we just don't know when it's going to take hold. Um, you know, and uh, we don't know if someone's going to be in a garage when two kids are going to be developing the alternate channel. That's going to change the world um, because everything is changing that fast. At the end of the day, it's all about value. Whether it's a service provider, an internal operation, we all recognize the fact that we as firms have to increase our revenue, particularly for those of us that are public companies. Okay, we need to certainly improve business efficiency as an internal operation. We need to contain our costs. And the biggest issue that people really need to pay attention today, particularly for the markets that we service, whether it's healthcare, whether it's financial, um, security and compliance is probably the single biggest expense that many of us are faced with and will continue to be faced with. Uh, as things go on. So one, I want to thank you. And you know, it's what we like to really try and say is, you know, around Broadridge is really as technology change, so does our system. So uh, I hope we didn't bore anybody. Um, Cameron will take you for the tour later this afternoon. Uh, I have to uh, head out to try to grab a flight. And uh, thanks for coming. Any questions? <laughs>